Excited to welcome Miami head coach Jim Laranaga to the basketball podcast. When Laranaga took over the University of Miami program in 2011, the school had reached the Sweet 16 just once in its history. Laranaga has brought the Hurricanes to the Sweet 16 three times since then, including the 2021-22 team that reached the Elite Eight. Before joining the University of Miami, he serves as the head men's basketball coach at American International College, Bowling Green State University, and George Mason University, where he coached the Patriots to 13 consecutive winning seasons and the Final Four of the 2006 NCAA Division I Men's Basketball Tournament. Laranaga has won several conference and national coach of the year awards in over 600 games as a head coach. Coach Laranaga, welcome to the podcast. My pleasure, Chris. Wonderful to talk to you. I mean, the success over so many years at so many places and, you know, not traditional powers, too, and uh, tremendous success <laughs> at those places uh, as well. So, uh, Coach, you appear to be very flexible from season to season. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, Chris, uh, basically, uh, my philosophy has been based on uh, the personnel that we have recruited. So, when I first got to Bowling Green State University, I was using this, the offensive system and defensive system that we employed at the University of Virginia under Terry Holland my last several years. So on offense, we were running the flex. We had five uh, interchangeable parts. The tallest starter was 6'6". Six, six. The shortest starter was like 6'2". So we just moved the basketball until we could get one of them a good shot. And my first year at Bowling Green as a head coach was 1986. Uh, when the three-point shot uh, became legal. And once the three-point shot became part of our, our offense, then things started to change. And uh, I really enjoyed my first couple of years running that Virginia system. But then my personnel changed quite a bit through the recruiting process. And as my personnel changed, I became very flexible. I, I, we needed to adapt to the new kind of player that we were recruiting. Some guys with size, we had two guys that were 6'10 in the starting lineup. We needed to take advantage of them. Uh, our defense changed. We started to um, utilize the scramble defense more. We wanted to, to force turnovers and create open court situations. And we even ran what uh, was affectionately known as the system which was a Paul Westhead style of play where we try to run and shoot in every seven seconds. And uh, it was a terrific way to play. Our guys loved it. Uh, we beat Michigan State in back-to-back -back years. We were the first team to beat them in the Breslin Center. And then they came back to Bowling Green, returned the game with Judd Heathcote. And we beat him again uh, at Anderson Arena on the Bowling Green campus. So We've been very flexible throughout the years, and that continues to this day. Yeah, there's no doubt if you've coached that long, you need to be flexible. And uh, you gave me an example saying that this past year, this team that uh, went to the Elite Eight, that this is the first time you used five out since your Bowling Green years. Can you talk a little bit about that, too? Yeah, that is correct. Uh, in the Bowling Green years, uh, because we were playing very, very fast and trying to open the court, play a lot in space, uh, we employed a five out offense and every player handled the ball. Every player had the opportunity to post up if he felt like he had a mismatch and every player was encouraged to look for the three. And we were a very explosive offensive team. This last season at the university of Miami, which led to our run to the elite eight was really, uh, determined last summer when my staff and I sat down and reviewed the entire uh, Atlantic Coast Conference rosters. We looked at everybody's team. And when we looked at, at Duke, they had five starters who would all be drafted in the NBA that weighed like 220 or more. You know, with, with Wendell Moore and, and uh, Trevor Keels being at the guard spot, and uh, Bancaro and, and Williams up front, they just were so big. Carolina the same way, uh, and, and Virginia the same way. So what we ended up deciding is we didn't really match them in the post. We didn't have big guys that could go inside, play with their back to the basket, and score at the rim. So what we decided to do was uh, employ a, a spread offense, five out, 
with our five men, Sam Wardenberg, trailing every play and pulling the opponent's big man away from the basket, giving Sam an opportunity to create um, some threes for himself and for others. Because Sam Wardenberg was a very skillful big guy at 6'10". He could catch, he could pass, he could shoot the three, he could drive it to the basket. He was a very good ball screener. So uh, we really enjoyed implementing that style because it gave all five guys a chance to utilize their strengths. And that's always been our goal, to take advantage of what our guys do very well individually and put it together collectively. Well, it's a fun team to watch and a fun style to watch. And uh, we're going to come back. I want to talk a little bit more about Five Out because, of course, it's very popular nowadays to talk about that. And uh, you used some unique things to help it be effective. But, I, I mean, I've got a chance to know you and your staff a little bit. So I want to spend some time on something I know that's really important. And you've spent time on not just what to teach, but how to teach. And maybe more time on that because it strikes me that uh, you value yourself as a teacher and I want to dive into some of that. And uh, you shared with me your five-step teaching method. And, uh, you know, Coach, maybe first talk about the value of teaching. And then secondly, one of the first steps of your teaching method is explanation. Can you talk about that too? Okay. Well, the first thing is I, I grew up in New York City. I played for what I think is the best high school basketball coach ever in Jack Kern at Archbishop Malloy High School. And I learned so much from him. Uh one of the funny stories I believe that got me into coaching was in my freshman year, our team uh, was seven and zero, oh, and uh, we went home for Christmas. When we came back from the Christmas break, coach Curran called me into his office and told me that the coach had quit, that they didn't have anybody else to coach the team. And he wanted me to be the coach to run practice and to coach the games. And that Dick Zeitler, who was a, freshmen along with me we were both scholarship freshmen by the way that we would coach the team for the remainder of the season and what ended up happening is we went undefeated we went 21 and 0 won the new york city championship and from that moment on i knew i wanted to be a coach i wanted to be a teacher i wanted to be like coach curran dick zeitler went on to, to be a, a high school coach and did that for the next 40 years and I, I love the teaching aspect of it. Jack Curran was a great teacher of the game of basketball and the game of life. And we were very, very close for the next 50 years. And he, he uh, taught in a way that was very, very simple. Explanation was the first step, meaning that he would explain to the players exactly what he wanted them to do and how he wanted them to do it. Now that came from probably the greatest college coach of all time, in my estimation, was John Wooden at UCLA. So we employed the John Wooden, Jack Curran system of a five-step method of teaching your players. And Chris, as you mentioned, explanation is one. So either me or one of my assistants will explain a drill or an offense or a defense, and then the players they have to be able to understand and then execute. Well, it's awesome. And uh, we're going to share the other four things as part of this teaching method. And uh, the second one is demonstration, coach. So after you explain something, you want someone who really knows how to do it to demonstrate the correct skill. So if it were an offensive skill, uh, it's a shooting drill. They're doing the correct footwork. They're, they're, uh, moving without the ball correctly or moving with the ball correctly. And if it's a, an offensive set, uh, we have a whole team of veterans that are demonstrating it so the newcomers can learn from the veterans. And that's very, very important to us. The explanation is in words, the demonstration you can see. And oftentimes the eyes are better teacher than the ear. Coach, it's great to hear. And uh, I love diving into teaching methods. And the third one is imitation. Can you talk about that? Yeah. Once we explain what we want done and a veteran group has demonstrated it, then the younger guys, the newcomers, are going to imitate that direction. So I explain, the, the veterans demonstrate. Now, in this particular case at the college level, it's our freshmen. 
They've just come in, it's summertime, we're introducing new things and they're imitating it. And when they imitate it, they don't often imitate it perfectly. So then the next step of the teaching method comes into play. And the next part is obviously correction. Once they're now doing things and now it's your job to be able to correct them. Yeah, what's, what's funny, when we say correction, oftentimes players might assume that means criticism. Mm. And it, it doesn't. We're not ever criticizing our players. And do you explain that specifically to your players, that correction is not criticism? Yeah. But my, when, when I talk about explanation, demonstration, imitation, and correction, when I stop at correction, I just say to them, look, at, we're going to make some very simple corrections. Maybe you need to do it faster or slower. Maybe, maybe you, you need to call for the ball if you're open. Maybe your cut needs, needs to be faster. Uh, whatever the correction might be, the players understand that once we explain it, the, the upperclassmen demonstrate it, you imitate it. The coaches have a job to do to be sure you're doing things correctly. Because if you start doing things incorrectly and you start doing those over and over again, then you're going to have mistakes constantly. So we have explanation, demonstration, imitation, correction, and then the fifth and final step. Which, of course, is repetition now. And we're going to dive into repetition a little bit more. But uh, go give us a simple explanation first, and we'll dive back into that. Well, it's, it's our belief that, that you play basketball based on your habits, the habits you develop in practice. And the way you develop a habit is through repetition. You do something correctly over and over again, whether it's your shot, your ball handling, might be your defensive slides or your defensive help. It might be blocking out and rebounding with two hands. Whatever is the habit that we want to develop, we want to repeat it over and over again so you do not have to think about it. That it has become an instinct. This is what I do. This is how I do it. I don't think about it. I do it every time and I do it correctly every time. So I just want to clarify this for coaches because too often when they hear people talk about habits and repetition, they assume that means memorization and doing things exactly the same way every day. So they memorize it and they regurgitate it. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about learning, which is permanent. And permanence requires, I know these are modern terms, but retrieval practice that leads to this permanence. And one of the ways that you do that within your coaching is through the use of constraints. So can you talk about getting these repetitions without being repetitive by using constraints? Okay, let's, let's uh, slow down a little bit. And <laughs> this stuff excites me, coach. About some of the things that have gone on throughout my career. Mm -hmm. uh, let's, let's first about talk about Daniel Coyle. Yep. Okay. Daniel Coyle wrote, wrote a book uh, called The Talent Code. And he described in the book the three things he felt were necessary to become the kind of expert in your area that you'd like to be, whether you're a coach or a player. The first step was ignition. You, you need to get ignited, motivated, something that uh, you know, lights your fire to say, I want to be a coach or I want to be an NBA player. There is something. I told you the story about what ignited me to want to be a coach was the opportunity I got as a ninth grader. I, the, the second step. Well, is, coach, let's just clarify for ignition too. It doesn't have to be these big things. It could be just, I want to get better at closeouts. Like yes, it's a motivation okay. to want to improve something. And for example, a skill. Exactly. And, and in Daniel Coyle, his idea was after ignition uh, comes master coaching. So what is that? A coach is a teacher someone who uh, has the skills to uh, explain and help someone learn. And then the last step, according to Daniel Coyle, is deep practice, where you have to learn how to do it, not just do it haphazardly, but do it correctly. And Daniel Coyle followed up uh, uh, his book, The Talent Code, with a book called the, the Little Book of Talent, 52 steps, at, 52 tips on how to teach skills. And my favorite of those 52 tips is habit 52. 
Number 52 is simply this. Think like a gardener, work like a carpenter. And what a gardener does, plant seeds, nurtures those seeds and let them grow. But it takes time. You have to have patience. It's the same thing for a coach with his players. You can't explain, you can't explain something one day and expect them just to know it and do it correctly all the time. You got to plant the correct seeds and nurture them. And then over a period of time, they will get better. But you also, also have to work like a carpenter where the things you're teaching and doing are very, very precise. You can't build a table and have one leg longer than the other. And it would be off balance. So that's the same thing true when you're working with, with your players. We have a great, great belief that, that coaching is teaching. Uh, for those folks who are listening to this podcast, understand this. My high school coach, Jack Kern, I never heard him use the vulgarity in his entire, we knew each other for 50 years. I don't use vulgarity. I don't allow my coaches to use vulgarity, not in practice, not in games, not in the locker room or at halftime, not after a game if I'm upset. No, we don't use vulgarity. It's a sign of self-discipline where, where you have to see yourself as a teacher. And I never have ever had a teacher in a classroom teaching me math or English, science or history, curse at me, all right? Now, I know a lot of coaches do that and they think it's great for motivation. I tend to believe that my job is to build self-esteem and confidence. And you don't get that by tearing someone down. You get that by reinforcing all the fundamentals that you're trying to teach and get them to do it correctly over and over again. So explanation, demonstration, imitation, correction, and repetition is our five-step teaching method. And then once we go on to the practice court, we have to find the best method to utilize those five steps. So Chris, I, I'm, I'm getting to your constraints. No, and, and now you're gonna talk about being the gardener. And I wanna, I wanna do that, because that's really the, the art of it that you're gonna talk about with the constraints. <clears throat> okay, well, well simply um, constraints are, are, are like limitations. You, you limit somebody. In, in anything, it, it could be in our case, we're teaching an offensive drill. We might limit the offensive player to two dribbles and, and say to him, okay, you've got two dribbles, but after two, if you take a third dribble, it's a turnover, all right? Secondly, it could be time. Uh, we, we have a drill we call seven seconds where the defensive player has to keep the offensive player out of the lane for seven seconds. Starting at midcourt, the offensive players on the attack, and we use the expression, guard your yard, meaning three feet to the right, three feet to the left, and don't let the guy get in the lane, all right? Now, we can also limit space. We can just say the offensive player cannot go wider than the three-second lane. But every time we use a constraint, whether it's number of dribbles, whether it's the restricting the size of the court or limiting, limiting the, the amount of time, it's always to focus either the offense or defense, and in most cases, both, to really understand limitations. Because in today's game, the one thing that drives us crazy as coaches is guys dribbling the ball to death. So to, to add value to what you're saying, there's two things. One is you're talking about limiting something, but to help something else evolve, to help shape something else. So if we limit, as you said, the dribbles, then we're trying to help something else appear and evolve. Uh, the second thing I want to really, really say to everyone is these are not new concepts. I'm imagining, Coach, you've used this stuff for a long time. It's just that now sport research has added terms and credibility and support to all this. And I've always said this, that great teachers are five years ahead of research anyways, because you're the one actually trying to help your players get better in the classroom setting, or in this example, in the coaching setting. Well, that's certainly true. And um, more, more recently in the NBA, there's been a lot of talk about analytics. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to analytics and constraints, they went hand in hand, as far as I was concerned, in 1971, when I began my college coaching career. Uh, Dean Smith, who was the Michelangelo of coaching, according to Dick Vitale, and uh, 
He used analytics and he used the number one, uh, the OER and DER to express to his team how they could achieve success. We, we used that at Davidson College when I was an assistant coach. We used it at Virginia when I was an assistant coach there. We used it at Bowling Green, George Mason in Miami. We've always tried to use analytics to help our players understand the value of a possession, how every possession has value, and that in order to win, we make a strong push for our players to understand we have to score more than one point per possession, and we've got to hold our opponent to less than one point per possession if we want to succeed. And by teaching your players certain offensive and defensive skills with constraints, they, they learn to play uh, with other good players. Because if you let one player just dribble the ball to death, you'll have four players standing around watching it. So I, I'm so excited to talk about this with you. And uh, I, I want to just say this, because to circle back to what I said about repetitions without being repetitive, here's the example. Let's say, Coach, we do three-on-three three every single day. It's not going to look the same to the player because of the constraints that you can use every day to shape things for that player. And if you're okay with it, I want to give some of the examples that you gave me. Uh, sure. Let's let's start with this one. Every shot must come off of a pass and assist. So that's a constraint within this three on three that shapes learning. Well, Chris, um, one of the uh, statistics that we look at very, very closely is how many assists are we getting in a game? Our goal is to get 16 assists or more. There are games where we've had far less and what would end up happening after that is we feel like our players have lost focus as to how we can be the most efficient offensive team we can be. So at practice, maybe after that game, during that week, we would say, okay, uh, this drill that we're doing uh, has some limitations, and it's this. Nobody can shoot off the bounce. Everybody's shot must come off the catch and you own and you you score the ball if it's a two, okay, it's a two pointer, but it's off of an assist, so you get three. If you shoot a three and make the three, well, it's off of a pass. You're going to get four for that. And there's a, a lot of competition. Uh, those games we keep score. There's time limits on it. Uh, in the the drill I'm thinking about, it's a 12 second clock, and so. For example, a team can score off of an offensive rebound by kicking it out for a three. You can't offensive rebound and stick it back in because that didn't come off of a pass. It came off of a rebound. That's not what we're looking for. And so our big guys, when they offensive rebound, sometimes during games, the best shot is a kick out three. And our players realize that from the drills that we do and, and the constraint that we put on. Well, it's, it's awesome because, it, I mean, you're connecting your constraints to analytics and what drives success in your program, which is ultimately what we want to do. They want to know that's what we worked on and it's helping us, isn't it? Exactly. And let, let me give you another example. These, these drills that we put together, and they all come from somebody else. Uh, we call this one Jeff Van Gundy. Uh, because we were at a clinic, one of my coaches, Chris Caputo, who's now the head coach at George Washington University, brought it back. It's a four on three drill. It has very special scoring. I, if, you, if you make a layup, it's two. If you make a three, it's three. But if it's offered an assist, you get another point. But then we add another constraint. We said, okay, no one can score until the ball hits the paint. So you're wide open from three, but the ball hasn't hit the paint. Uh, that won't count as a bucket, even if you make the shot. And the ball has to hit the paint before you shoot it. So the ball has to move pretty quickly, four on three. Someone drives into the lane. Now you kick it out. You get a three plus a point for the assist. That shot is worth four. So each day we try to create in our players' minds what has value taking difficult shots, contested shots, 
are really bad for the offense. And our players are hopefully learning from that. And I, the reason I really try and share constraints so much with so many and why I'm happy for this conversation is it, it, it does create mindful practice for your players, doesn't it? Instead of mindless practice, they've got to account for so many things. And that's just game like, isn't it? That they have to think, they have to decide. And I'm giving you the example as one of your defenders, if they're competitive and they know the constraint for the offense is they must catch and shoot, then what's the defense going to do if they're smart, coach? They're going to try and drive that player to a dribble because they're not allowed to shoot off the dribble. So it's just this game back and forth that makes them very mindful, isn't it? Yes. And in that particular case, uh, if a, a, a defender knows that the, sh that the shot has to come off of a pass and he sees a guy's open from three, he might fly out of, under, out of control to block that shot. The offensive player then has to make the decision, okay, I, I'm not shooting this, but I can penetrate, get into the paint and, and then kick it out. And the next guy can get the open shot. So it, it creates the, the mindset of share the ball. That's a big part of our coaching philosophy. Share the basketball. Yeah. And it shines through with some of the constraints you use. Um, I, one, one constraint that you shared with me that I want you to talk about, I think it's brilliant is only this player can rebound. Everyone else must block out. This is a great constraint to teach rebounding, isn't it? Well, he, here's what we find, that there are some guards in particular that never go to the, the, the defensive backboards, and they think it's a big man's job. So what we do is we'll say to the players, okay, uh, it, they might, it might be a, a, a two-on-two or three-on-three drill. But I'll say, okay, only the point guard can rebound. Everybody else just block out, keep your man from getting to the glass so that the point guard can get, get the rebound. And it'll put in, in the player's mind, man, that, that means I got to go get the basketball. All right? And we've done that throughout uh, our years at, at uh, Miami. And I'm very, very proud to say that it led to Shane Larkin being an outstanding defensive rebounder. Angel Rodriguez was a great rebounder. Uh, Bruce Brown, probably the best. We played him at the point and uh, at times and said, okay, the only guy in this drill that can rebound is the point guard. And Bruce, you're the point. And he'd get every rebound. And this past season, Charlie Moore was our point guard. And we, we made such a strong emphasis for Charlie to rebound. And he would be like, coach, I'm only 5'11", 6 feet tall. I, you know, everybody's so much bigger than me. I said, I don't care. Rebounds don't come above the rim very often. And you can get in there and make things happen. And so we try to emphasize that. If there's a, a player who should be a good rebounder, who's not rebounding under game conditions, we'll put that drill in place. And that guy knows all eyes are on him to become a, a terrific rebounder. It, it's awesome. And you, and you say drill, but really that constraint can be put into any other drills that you have already, right? Like that's sure. something that you can add on. So we don't want to think about that as just a separate drill. That's something you can add on, right? Yes. Talk to me about some of these other ones too, coach. And uh, I know you use some acronyms here, but T-O-B-E drill, reduce turnovers. Okay. That I, I call TOBE. T-O-B-E stands for turnover, ball, elimination. Okay. When we're emphasizing to our players, that they're turning the ball over way too much, making careless passes or not catching the ball with two hands. Uh, the, the offense is, is turning the ball over way too often. We tell them, okay, we're going to be in the Toby drill for the rest of practice. Meaning uh, we have 12 basketballs in a rack. You turn the ball over, that ball gets eliminated. That's gone. Now you turn over another one. That ball is gone. And pretty soon you're reducing the number of basketballs in the rack. And the players understand that when there's no more basketballs, what do we do, Chris? We condition, <laughs> we run. You create uh, emphasis. <laughs> we, we, we do not play basketball anymore because you guys are too careless with the ball. So as the balls in the rack get eliminated, 
that the players start coaching each other. Don't throw a difficult pass. Come to me all passes. Don't try anything dangerous. And so they start focusing more on simplicity, on throwing simple passes and completing it. And the defense, the defense picks up because we might have it where one team is the one that's turning it over too much in a five on five situation. And we we'll say, okay, this team is in the Toby drill. And they might have six balls that they have, but after the six, that team is running. And it forces everybody to realize the importance of not turning the basketball over. You said something so important, I feel, too, is that you don't do that. That's not every drill, and that's not every day, is it? This no, is, no. yeah, you're the gardener, and that's coming back to this gardener example, right? That if you do that every day, you're taking away player freedom and you want to balance their freedom and creativity with not turning the ball over. And if you did it every day, you would restrict them. Talk to me about that, because that's that's the art, I feel, that what you said there. Well, I don't know if any of your listeners are golfers or if they would know this name. But one of my dearest friends who I've known for more than 40 years is Dr. Bob Rotella. You know who Dr. Rotella is, Chris? Sports psychologist, isn't he? He's a yeah. sports psychologist. And we got he to know with him. Tiger Woods, if I remember, too. Well, he's, he, he works with uh, probably 30 of the top golfers. He's worked with everybody that John Calipari has ever coached since his UMass days. Uh, he's, he's an expert in sports psychology, meaning the mental side of the game. And we're always emphasizing to our players that mental is to physical as four is to one. Meaning it's four times more important to be mentally right than, than the physical. Every player we have is physically capable, but are you the one that makes good decisions? Are you, are you smart? Are you someone that understands the game mentally? So we've, we've used Dr. Rotella throughout my career, talking to individual players about, about how to play the game of basketball. And in his particular case, he's always emphasizing to me, and I want you to understand, I mean this sincerely, during games, clap for mistakes. What does that mean, clap for mistakes? So now all the teaching that we've done in practice, once the game begins, we're not teachers anymore. We're cheerleaders. And you say, what does that mean? You don't want your players looking over to the bench every time they make a mistake. They, they were, am I going to get taken out of the game? Is coach mad at me for missing that shot? Is he mad because I turned it over? So my players are going to always see me smiling and clapping, even when they make a mistake. That in turn helps them relax so that they're not worried about being jerked out of the game because they, they made one mistake or two mistakes. And it's very, very important. Dr. Hotel is always emphasizing Build confidence, build their self-esteem. Let them know that you're their biggest fan because if you believe in them, they'll believe and trust in you. And so that's what we try to do. So even though in practice, we might be emphasizing no turnovers, no bad shots, don't take a contested three, all those things. Once the game begins, we want our players to know we're behind them 100%. We believe in them. Go out and do your job. My, my coaches say to our recruits all the time, Coach L is going to give you a lot of freedom to be who you are. I tell the recruits, I'm going to give you a lot of responsibility to make a lot of good decisions. You've got to be mentally sharp to play at the University of Miami, meaning you have a high basketball IQ, which has been taught to you by my staff, and we're excited about your ability to lead us to success. Love that. That's gold, Coach. Thanks for sharing that example. Um, Floyd Miller missed layup. What's that? <laughs> well, I was the head coach of Bowling Green State University, and we recruited Floyd Miller out of Brooklyn, New York. Tremendous <laughs> talent, great kid, worked really, really hard. But in his freshman year, he would miss more layups and dunks than any player you could ever possibly imagine. And I kept saying to myself, how do we teach this young man to realize that he could be a great player if he just made his layups and dunks? He was missing so often. 
So we created what we call the Floyd Miller rule. And that was very simply this. If you miss a layup, Floyd, you got to do 10 push-ups. If you miss a dunk, you got to do 20 push-ups. Now, this is always in practice, and it's always uncontested. If you go in for a contested layup in practice and you miss a contested layup, okay, you, you missed because the defense made you miss. But if you're uncontested, and that can be in two-line layups warming up, you got to do 10 push-ups for a missed layup, 20 push-ups for a missed dunk. And because we did not want to single out Floyd, we called it the Floyd Miller rule, but it, it applied to everybody. And it's been that way throughout these last 30 years of my coaching career. And by the way, Floyd Miller became the leading field goal percentage shooter in Bowling Green history when he graduated. So it really worked. He quit missing layups, quit missing dunks. He started to do things more simply without the twists and turns and double clutches and 360s. He just did it in a simple way. And it led to great success. In his senior year, he shot over 65% from the field, and he was one of the top five field goal percentage shooters in the country, and basically making layups, dunks. Great stuff. I mean, Google's getting a workout with this podcast, too, for all those listeners. Uh, one to connect to so many of the things that you're mentioning from the past, which is awesome as well. Uh, coach, must have STS and BS before shooting. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, STS is a screen-to-screener action, and BS is a ball screen. So again, a constraint before you put the ball up in the air to shoot it, you've got to do some things first. One of our great beliefs is the ball's got to change sides and you have to have some movement. And we're talking about half court offense. We're not talking about transition, not talking about fast breaks. In our mind, transition is simply this. It's a racetrack and the first one to the rim can win. If you can put a big guy down the floor or a guard, out running the field, you'll get a lot of layups, all right? One game we played, uh, Dick Vitale was doing the game, and he kept saying about our Miami team, they're getting layup after layup after layup. Well, that's the transition part. We're not talking about that. We're talking about when the defense of opponent is set. They have five defensive players back. We're bringing the ball across midcourt, and now it's five on five. So a lot of times we, we do several things. We, we do a lot of ball screening in our offensive sets. In fact, we've led the country in scoring off of ball screens. Um, in the last, uh, I, this is, we've just completed our 11th season. We've been in the top five teams in the country in scoring off of ball screens the last 11 years. We were number one or number two many of those years with Shane Larkin, Angel Rodriguez, and Bruce Brown, and those groups. So ball screens and screen the screener type action are part of our normal offensive schemes. So one of the constraints might be, we would tell our, our offensive team, no shot until we get at least one of each. And then the, the opponent uh, oftentimes will recognize that and really try to disrupt was unlike a lot of coaches, uh, we are uh, organized in a uh, football type staff. I have an offensive coordinator, a defensive coordinator, and a scout team coordinator. So in this particular drill that I was describing, my offensive coach would be telling the players, this is what we're doing, this is what we're running. We've got to get at least one ball screen, one screen to screen of action while my defensive coordinator is telling the team, we've got to break up the ball screen and we can't let them come off the screen in the screen of action and get a catch and shoot three. So I hope that explains that, Chris. I, I love it. I love it. Again, how it connects back to your principles of play. Like you're using constraints that connect back to how you want to play. Um, last constraint I want to ask you about before I get into some of that ball screen and the five out stuff is uh, two players to the offensive rebound. Uh, okay. One of, one of the things we find is, and it can be described differently in a sense this, we're going to send our four and five man to the offensive board every time. But the question we ask is who's back? Who is back? 
Three players must get back. They must beat the ball to the to our defensive end. So we have at least three guys always back defensively, while two players have the responsibility of trying to get us a second shot. And if those two guys don't go to the glass, the reason has to be they knew they had no shot of getting an offensive rebound. They might have said, oh, I knew that shot was going in, so I just wanted to get back, even though that's against our, our rebound principles. Our rebound principles say assume every shot will miss when you're an offensive rebounder. But from a defensive standpoint, uh, those two players have to have the encouragement to go to the offensive boards on every single possession. And if they don't, they better be back defensively. They're not in no man's land. Awesome stuff. And I know there are so many coaches who are probably yelling at me to ask you more questions after you mentioned that you were so good with ball screens. So coach, we got to go back to that a little bit. So what are some of the keys beyond talented players, obviously, in terms of your ball screen success, do you feel? Well, I got to go back to my high school days of playing for Jack Curran at Archbishop Malloy High School. Uh, the way we practiced at Malloy, both offensively and defensively, made everybody uh, feel like they're always on the same page. I, I think trying to get players on the same page is really, really important. Um, are you familiar uh, with Dr. Stephen Covey? Of course. Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Read the book. I think it was like 19 early or late 1980s, that book. I read it in 1993. And it's been a major part of my coaching philosophy ever since. And the seven habits are not about basketball. They're basically about life. But I apply them to basketball because I want my players to understand how we're going to teach and coach and work with you. So when you're, when you're wanting to build the habits, okay, the first habit is be proactive. I describe that to my players as be proactive means plan ahead. We have to plan practice, right? Before we practice, we've got to have a plan. If you're a player, you have to have a plan. And my players are going to learn their plan, develop their plan in practice. So once the game begins, everybody knows the shots we want them to shoot because that's how we've practiced the game. Plan ahead. This is what we're doing. And a, a good example, I think, of this is um, we have a, a drill called five minutes of threes. Players will often ask me, coach, can I shoot the three? And I tell them, we have one simple rule. Shoot the shots that you can make at a consistent basis, a high percentage. I, oh, well, I'm a great three-point shooter. Okay, well, in five minutes of threes, we're going to shoot threes for five full minutes. One minute from the right corner, one minute from the right wing, one minute from the top of the key, one minute left wing, one minute left corner. And we're going to keep track every day. And if you average 50 made threes or more, you get the green light. That means if you're open, that's a good shot for you. You make it on a consistent basis. That's the green light. If you're averaging between 40 and 50, that's the yellow light. A little more caution. Yes, you can shoot it, but you're not shooting five or eight or 10 in a game. You might shoot one or two. If you're below 40 on the average, what, what color light do you think that is, Chris? It'd be red. <laughs> that would be the red light, meaning that's not a good shot for you. And we do that with our shooting. We keep statistics on everybody in every practice, and then share that with the players so that they know the shots they're shooting well and the shots they're not shooting well. We had a player named Daquan Jones who ended up playing in the NBA. I only got a chance to coach him one year. During that year, I could see this kid was so gifted athletically and very skillful, but his percentages on certain shots were so low I called him into my office. I said to him, hey, DJ, 
We need to talk about your offensive skills. Tell me what kind of shooter you are. Oh, I'm a great shooter coach. Mm -hmm. I don't really make shots. I said, okay, tell me what your favorite move is. He said, that'd be my Kobe. <laughs> okay, your Kobe Bryant move? Yeah, how does that work? I go between my legs three or four times, I shoot a fadeaway jumper. I said, right. <laughs> And you shoot that pretty regularly in practice, don't you? And he said, yeah, every day. I said, do you know what percentage you shoot on the Kobe? He goes, no, I've got no idea. I said, you shoot, you make it 20% of the time, about one in five. He said, really? I said, how about when you're inside and you shoot a jump hook? Do you know what percentage you shoot on your right-handed jump hook? Again, I got no clue. Would you believe you shoot it 57% of the time? You make it 57% of the time. He said, really? I said, so what shot should you be looking for? The Kobe or the jump hook? He went on to shoot mostly jump hooks instead of the Kobe. His field goal percentage shot up and it led to him becoming more of an analytics guy, a better basketball IQ. He never realized what his percentage was on his favorite move and never realized how good he was at a different shot. So we spend a lot of time with our players. It starts with the five minutes of threes because everybody wants to earn the green light. And because we do that drill every single day, we can show them, look at, I'm not telling you not to shoot the three. You're telling me. You can't make it high enough for us to win. We want to win. That's the objective. And if you're shooting shots that are bad shots for you, we're likely going to lose. And then that's how, you know, we do with the teaching. We're Awareness is a powerful thing, isn't it, Coach? I love that connection to be proactive. Um, do you want to go through some of the other habits or? Sure. Okay. Well, in Stephen Covey, the, 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 the uh, second habit is begin with the end in mind. Uh, and that is, you know, what do you want to accomplish in this practice? What do you want to accomplish in this season? Where are we heading? How are we going to get there? You have to have a path. You have to know where you're going. So begin with the end in mind. So you would never go on the road. I'm going to be going on the road recruiting. All right? Be proactive. Plan ahead. I know exactly where I'm going. I'm going to Atlanta. I'm going to Charlotte. I'm going to Kansas City. I'm going to Vegas. I have a plan in mind of where I'm going. And begin with the end, how I'm going to end up. Where am I going to be? How am I getting back? I have to have flights. I have to have rental cars. I have to have hotels. Everything is about planning. So you've got to begin with the end in mind of what you're trying to accomplish, whether it's in practice or in games. You have to have a good plan. You've got to be able to execute the plan. Habit number three is put first things first, meaning prioritize your priorities. You have a priority. What is it? Okay, let's say it's defense. Okay, prioritize that. What, what are you doing? Well, we got to work on closeouts today. That's a real priority. Or we got to work on defensive rebounding because we're not rebounding very well. Whatever your priorities are. And then the next habit is think win-win. You, you, you don't want to have to, to do things where it's win-lose, where you're compromising your principles. And then the fifth is, is seek first to understand and then to be understood. Okay, so this leads me to a, to a story. Uh, for those guys who have followed Miami basketball, we had a player named Kenny Kaji. All right? So he came into my office the very first day I met him. Uh, he was already a sophomore. He was a transfer from the University of Florida. And he came in and sat, sat at my uh, desk. And, and I said to him, Kenny, tell me, tell me about yourself. And um, he said, Coach, I'm a stretch four. And I said, how tall are you? Uh, he said, 6'11", 272 pounds. And I said, and you're a stretch four? He said, yeah. I said, well, Kenny, uh, do you know what a stretch four does? He says, yeah, shoots threes. I said, okay, so I never saw you play at Florida. How many threes did you make at Florida? He said, none, they wouldn't let me shoot them. <laughs> <laughs> so I said to him, okay, uh, we have a very simple rule. We got a drill called five minutes of trees. If you can make them, make over 50, you, you're going to get the, the green light. And sure enough, that very first day, he made 57 and he made 55 to 65 almost every day. He was a terrific shooter. But to get back to my point, 
seek first to understand and then to be understood. I wanted to know where he was coming from. I didn't want to say, oh, Kenny, you're 6'11", 272. We're going to play you in the low post and really get, get the ball to you. Because if I said that to him, he would have been not, not again. I wanted to listen and learn what he was all about. We do that with all our players. We did it with Kenny Kaji this past year. We did it with Charlie Moore, who had been already to three different schools, California, uh, Kansas, DePaul. Now he was coming to the University of Miami. And all I wanted to know was, Charlie, what are you all about? By understanding him, I was able to coach him much better. And then the sixth habit is synergize, which is what we're always working towards. Having the, 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 the uh, some of the parts greater than the individual parts. So as a team, it's all about teamwork. And then habit number seven, which we greatly believe in, is sharpen your saw, which basically means rest and recover, uh, rejuvenate yourself so that you can always be at your best. You need sleep. You need hydration, you need nutrition, you need conditioning. You want to be at your best as often as you possibly can be. Wow, coach. Thank you. Because I mean, too often we get bombarded as coaches with lists, right? The seven habits of highly effective people. But what you did is you gave power to the list by making them practical for us and giving examples that actually apply. And that's that's really the value of those lists is it's practical and it helps apply things. So it's just great. Now we've gone through that, Coach. Let's circle back to the ball screen example. How did you become such a, an effective ball screen coach and effective ball screen team? Well, it's, it's funny. I told you we're very flexible. Mm. And uh, flexibility comes in a lot of different areas. When it came to offense, we, we were at Miami in my first year, and we had a lot of guys. We, we ran an offense at, at George Mason and that we implemented initially at Miami, and it wasn't working. And when I sat with my staff, I said, well, if, if we fully examine the strengths of these players, they're not catch-and-shoot guys. They like to put the ball on the ground. They're very, very good at attacking off the bounce. So what we need to do is create opportunities for them to attack off the bounce by giving them ball screens. And we're going to do it a lot of different ways. And so we started implementing very simple offensive techniques, and we started with drills. And one of the first drills we implemented is called OKC, the Oklahoma City Thunder. Back then, they had uh, James Harden, uh, Russell Westbrook, and, and Kevin Durant. So uh, it was a three-on-zero which we uh, drill, which became a three-on-three -three drill where you had a ball screener and roller, a ball screener who picked and popped. Uh, on the roll, if the ball screener rolled, we had a lift man. So the offensive player with the basketball had to learn to read and react to how the defense was playing. And our defensive coordinator would defend the ball screens. He would tell the defensive three-man team several different ways to play the ball screen. Switch it, trap it, ice it, uh, hedge or show really hard, uh, jam it. And so the offense – how to learn how to read and react to each situation as a three-man team. And then we had to grow that to four-on-four four and eventually five-on-five. Five. But the, the ball screener knew what his job was, how to set the screen, the angle of the screen. We call it cracking, where a, a screener's – the crack of his rear end – is facing where he wants his teammate to go. So we don't want a screener to run out and, and set the screen where his crack is facing midcourt. The guy can just go under the ball screen and it's not effective. But he wants to get the lower third of the de defensive player, make that guy fight to get over that screen. So we go from three on three to four on four to five on five. 
I hope that answers some of your questions, Chris. Absolutely. It's great. And it connects to everything that you've talked about through the, the whole podcast. And, and I did promise the listeners, we're going to talk a little bit about five out. So, and you've, you've talked about it a little bit through everything we've done, but you sent me five, five things, run to daylight, cut hard and finish your cut, catch and see. I want to talk about the fourth, especially. And the fifth one was movement. The ball must change sides of the floor, which you talked about when we talked about constraints, but the fourth one, help somebody else get open by screening or slipping a screen, cutting or penetrating and pitching. Can you talk about that one in particular and just in general, some of the five out things that you did this year that you found successful? Okay. The, the first teaching point run to daylight is something we talk about on offense constantly. And, and that is, I, I see way too many players that, that don't understand spacing. Uh, they'll, they'll try to split a ball screen and they'll end up turning it over or, or worse yet, get a knee in the thigh because there wasn't enough room. So we're constantly talking about uh, running to daylight. Try to find the space where you can go comfortably. The, the second thing um, that uh, we mentioned was about cutting because I think too many times a guy doesn't cut with a purpose. He'll cut, not even looking for the ball sometimes. Or he'll cut and he'll stop his cut midway because oh, I'm not going to get it anyway, and then come back. That's not what we're teaching. We want someone who cuts hard with a purpose and doesn't stop the cut. Um, the 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 area that you're talking about, uh, please re repeat it again. I, well, the the third one was catch and see, which is read yeah. the defense, and you've Just talked read, every time you touch the ball, you got to read the, read the defense. Your defender. And, and we talk about the three things you have to control. You have to control yourself, you have to control your defender, but you also have to control the other eight guys. And the way you control them is by seeing and seeing how they react to what you're doing. And then, and then uh, number four, again, repeat that, Chris. Of Help somebody else get open by screening yeah. or slipping a screen. And when I, when I picture your team this year, I picture that, that I saw a lot of that helping the five out with spacing, but also with creating gaps. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to just use some numbers. They're the easiest way for me to visualize. Please. Uh, so one has the ball. He's our point guard coming across the, uh, the uh, mid court line on the right side of the floor. Uh, the the uh, two man is in the right corner. The five man is trailing the play is uh, like at the logo of most courts. Uh, the four man is at the left uh, slot position and uh, the, uh, uh, two, where I have two in the right corner, and uh, yeah, I think three yeah. is on the, the, the left corner. So, two and three occupy the corners, five is trailing, four is on the left wing. What we want is, is to change sides of the floor. So, the first thing we're going to do is one's going to throw it to five, and four is going to cut because the moment he cuts, he's going to open up the guy in the on his side of the court. Actually, four has three different options. He can cut, he can screen for the three man in the corner, or he can take a dribble handoff from the five. We want immediate movement and touches. We want the ball to change sides and, and we want cutting. So what, what guys will do, let's say the five man has it, he'll dribble at four, four will back door, he'll hand it to three. As three comes off of that ball screen, one is moving and getting two now involved. Two is coming off of the, the screen by, by one. They're interchanging. Three, three will throw it, throw it to two. And as soon as he does, five is going to set a flare screen for him. Five comes right back. He screened, handed off. He rolled a little bit, but now he's flashing up. And he's trying to get his man to overreact to his flare screen. And if that five man overreacts, He'll slip that screen and he'll be open going to the basket. If the five man doesn't react, hopefully the five man has gotten the three man open and we've opened up the left side of the floor. I don't know if coaches can visualize that, but the I, idea I think is, they can. The idea is uh, we want more people to touch the ball quickly and move the defense. So one started with it, he hit five. Uh, four cut, three handled the ball, he threw it to two, then it might be back to five on, a, on a, a slip, or it might be back to three on a flare, and then we've got good ball movement and we're changing sides. 
And that's only one of the very basic uh, entries into five out. I can picture, um, Coach, particularly against a team like Duke that tried to pressure, a lot of your five out led to not the first cut working, but the second cut. A lot of double cut actions as well, which is, again, reading and playing off to what the defense does, but also in support of your teammates seeing what happened before you. Right, exactly. One, one of the things that, that uh, changes from game to game because of our flexibility, we have what we call defensive, I'm sorry, offensive packages. So against Virginia, who plays the pack defense, we might run something very different against them than we do against a Duke or Carolina who might be out there denying. So we need to have our players be able to adjust to the circumstances they're going to see on the court. And all of that comes uh, with game preparation. Well, it speaks back to the flexibility. It's not just flexibility from one season to the next. It's also within the season as well, isn't it? Exactly. Coach, as we wrap up, I just want to reconnect everyone back to who you are as a person and uh, get you to talk a little bit about your coaching philosophy. Because, you know, over the years, you've broken it down into three words, attitude, commitment, and class. Can you talk about that? Yeah. Back when I became a head coach, uh, I realized that, my responsibility was to teach these young men, not just the game of basketball, but the game of life. And the three things that I kept emphasizing and have emphasized for the last 40 or 50 years is to be successful in whatever you do, you have to have the right attitude. So we describe it as a positive attitude towards everything you do. Life is 10% uh, what happens to you and 90% how you react to it. The second is, we want our players and everybody associated with our program to make a total commitment to being the best that they can be. That's unconditional commitment. It's not that I'm committed when things are going well, but not committed if, if I'm not starting, if I'm not playing a lot. No, a total commitment to being the best that you can be in everything you do. And that commitment has to reach all four levels. Commitment has four levels, physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. And we talk about that all the time. And then the third, third step of our, our, uh, our philosophy is class. By class, we mean behavior. Behave in a first-class manner. Be a role model for younger kids. Be a role model for our program. Be a role model student. Be a role model citizen. Because in one day, basketball is going to end. You know, develop first-class behavior. That's what will help you be successful. Someone with a positive attitude who's willing to make a total commitment, great work ethic, and to always behave in a first-class manner. That's our philosophy. Just tremendous, unbelievable stuff, Coach. Thanks for uh, sharing the game with us and sharing so many insights in terms of what's helped you be successful over such a long period of time. My pleasure, Chris. Enjoy talking with you.